Modern Railways. In-depth railway news. Hello and welcome to the preview of the April edition of Modern Railways. You might wonder about it at times, but this does not contain any April Fool jokes. I never think they work very well in a monthly magazine that comes out before the first of the month. Of course, that doesn't mean you won't, at times, think you must be joking. Actually, we've got some good news this month, so let's hear from the editor, Philip Sherratt, about some railway reopenings and the big new railway, the Elizabeth Line. Philip, over to you. Thanks very much, Ian, and hello, everyone. Welcome to another podcast. The months are rolling on, and we're on our April issue now. So what have we got in store for you? Well, we're looking at two uh, schemes this month which are concerned with restoring passenger services to railways that used to have them. One of them, the track's already there. Uh, one of them, the track is being rebuilt. So the, that latter one is East-West Rail. So uh, we have two features on this because uh, they were sort of brought two different elements to cover with the project. First of all, we look at the construction that's ongoing on the Bicester to Bletchley section, uh, which is being rebuilt so an Oxford to Milton Keynes service can start in 2024 or 25. And so I've spoken to the East West Rail Alliance about the work that they're doing, and it's progressing really quite well. They're into track lane, and things are ticking along nicely. So that's on course to have the infrastructure ready in May 2024 for a period of testing and trial running. More broadly, uh, my colleague James Abbott spoke to East West Rail Company Chief Executive Simon Blanchflower. The East West Rail Company, if you remember, was the arm's length body set up by the government to oversee the project. As a whole, that's the Oxford to Cambridge Railway, not just the bit that's being built at the moment. So he talks a little bit about that, but also the development work that they're ongoing for, uh, that's ongoing for the route onto Bedford and then onto Cambridge the Aylesbury Spur, the thorny issue of why is it not being electrified, and the broad strategic plan as regards the service. So I think that's a really interesting pair of articles and um, which I've uh, really enjoyed researching and reading. And then we look at the Northumberland line. So the track of that is still there. It's a freight line, the uh, Blyburn Tye line from Newcastle to Washington. There is going to be a bit more track put in because they're um, creating some more double track sections. They've got planning permission for the stations. So hopefully soon government funding will be signed off for the uh, delivery bit of that and that can get going. And passenger services should begin 2023 or 24, all being well. So it's great to see that project making excellent progress. So two really good projects for us to report on. We also have extensive coverage of our Golden Whistles event from the end of February, uh, including who's, who all the winners were. Uh, reports from our conference presentations and reports from David Horne's keynote speech. Uh, David drew parallels with 100 years ago when the world was emerging from a pandemic and the railways were just about to be restructured. Well, some things don't change, but he did have some very pertinent lessons for us, uh, which I think are definitely worth reading. Uh, now, many of you will know Chris Loder. Chris used to work in the rail industry, but is now the MP for West Dorset, was elected in December 2019. Uh, Chris was actually able to attend the Golden Whistles with us, which was great, as he was um, uh, heavily involved with founding the event uh, back over a decade ago now. But I've spoken to him for this issue for a feature about his views on the rail industry, and he thinks that we are missing opportunities to change service patterns and respond to the, the different landscape in the environment of covid he also has some very strong views about rail services in his constituency, uh, and there's three lines that serve the West Dorset constituency, the Weymouth to London line, the West of England line, and the Heart of Wessex line, and, um, and about potential for investment down there. And also, he has some interesting views on HS2, so you can read all about that. And then we have the latest of Roger's retrospectives on the 70s. This is for our 60th anniversary year. This is uh, retrospective number two, our second decade, uh, where you can read a bit about the history and a bit about where modern railways was at the time. In terms of news, uh, we have some sombre news to report on, which is the RAIB report on the Carmont derailment. You can read um, our reporting on that this month and also some analysis in our Rail Talk editorial. I think that's probably fairly self-explanatory, but um, I hope you find uh, what we've done on that of interest. Obviously, the report is out there um, to read. 
More positively, uh, we have report some reporting on Crossrail and HS2. On HS2, I attended quite an interesting event organised by Rail Forum Midlands with the Alstom Hitachi joint venture, uh, which is building the new trains. So we've got a few more details about that. Obviously, the procurement, uh, it's a very slow burner, this one, in terms of we won't actually see construction starting for a couple of years. The first train will be a couple, few years after that. But uh, we're getting some more detail, and in particular, what the two joint venture partners are each bringing in terms of what they'll be doing within the uh, construction of the trains. And uh, also on HS2, uh, we've just had some revised designs for Euston Station in London released. So my colleague James Abbott has uh, done a little bit of a summary on that. But uh, you will be able to read, if you're a subscriber, with the May issue, a more comprehensive report in our quarterly HS2 feature where we can go into a bit more detail. So uh, definitely worth subscribing uh, to make sure you get to your copy of the May issue. And then the other positive one is Crossrail. So we know that this has been a bit of a saga because of the delays and financial overruns, but the Elizabeth line is really now close to opening, and I was privileged to go and take a trip on it from Paddington to Liverpool Street and back quite recently. And I can tell you that when you actually go down and experience it, the stations, the trains, and the whole railway experience, it really is excellent. And I really can't wait for it to open and for uh, to be carrying passengers. So I've got a bit of a summary of what that experience was like. There's also a video that you can watch on our website and our YouTube channel, uh, which tells you a little bit more about that. But I want to signpost you again to our May issue when we're going to have a special feature about Crossrail and opening the Elizabeth line. Uh, we have interviews with all the key players involved with completing the project, features on trains, signalling, operations, maintenance. So it's going to be a very comprehensive overview of London's newest railway. I'm really looking forward to getting it finished off. It's already well on the way. Um, we're editing the features and getting them into design as we speak. So, a very busy uh, time for us. We're doing lots of events. We've got a very busy May issue coming up, but April has lots to commend us as well, as I hope you'll agree. So, that's me for this month. And with that, I'll hand back over to Ian. Thank you, Philip. Next, of course, is Roger Ford. Roger is talking about progress on electrification. And there is progress too. What's better, a long-term loose commitment to a rolling programme or a definite commitment with a budget? I'm all for getting on with it, but let's hear it from Roger. Roger. This month, uh, as, uh, as in previous months, uh, there's been a, there's a strong focus on electrification with some not so good news and some quite good news. Uh, the not so good news is that there's been a change of sentiment in government uh, in, on a rolling programme of electrification. Uh, after a, a year or two of uh, solid commitments, for instance, in the uh, Traction Decarbonisation Network Study and the uh, recently published Integrated Rail Plan, uh, the mood seems to be that uh, that's all we're going to get. Uh, colleagues who have been uh, lobbying for electrification in recent uh, weeks have been told to stop moaning about the subject. And I think the mood in uh, Department for Transport of the Treasury is that uh, they've committed uh, to uh, Transpennine Express, uh, Transpennine route upgrade, and also to Midland Main Line ex electrification extension. And when industry says, well, we'd really like a 10-year rolling programme so that we could invest in you know, people and equipment to get costs down, the message is that you've got those two big schemes, prove you can deliver on those first, and then we'll think about it. Uh, I also report on a, a worrying example of, uh, of a distraction activity. Uh, in the November last year minutes for the Network Rail Board meeting, they note that there was uh, not a big rail representation at the COP26 uh, conference last year, uh, but that uh, there was quite a lot of battery and hydrogen stuff on show. And the uh, board then decides that it'd be a good idea to see whether uh, to revisit the uh, laws of physics and see whether a, a hydrogen powered freight locomotive would be a good idea. And they've asked the university to do some work on that. Well, you know my views on that. I produced a hydrogen deltic a few, a few weeks, a few issues ago, and um, I'll be revisiting that just to look to make sure that the laws of physics haven't changed since the last time. The good news is that behind the scenes, uh, the engineers and the various companies involved in electrification have been doing a lot of work on uh, reducing the need uh, to knock down 
bridges for, for, to give the necessary clearances. Uh, there was a very good uh, symposium organised by the Permanent Way Institution uh, last year. And um, the message from that emerged was that uh, for future electrification schemes, uh, reconstructing bridges to provide uh, clearance for the overhead line wires uh, is the last of last resorts and probably applies only to about 5% of the bridges on the network that's still to be electrified. Uh, the Wigan Bolton electrification uh, has been authorised and you may remember that that came out at a very expensive 78 million for 13 miles and that was partly blamed on the fact that it had 17 bridges. Well, uh, that's been looked at uh, by the, the National Electrification Efficiency Panel or NEEP and they're uh, applying all the various techniques that have been uh, developed uh, in the past year or so. Uh, they've realised that it can be done with only one bridge being lifted and uh, two being uh, restored because of their poor condition. And that brings the cost down, the actual cost of electrification down from 30 million to 15 million, which is pretty impressive and is at the bottom range of the sort of costs that uh, the Row Industry Association's uh, study showed should be possible well under uh, 1 million per single track kilometre. Uh, but that, of course, uh, leaves the question of where does the rest of the 78 million come from? And that's down to the overheads, the overheads of about 150 uh, percent on, on electrification schemes. And I look at that and consider how we can get that down. Well, having dealt with electrification, um, I've moved to this uh, phenomenon of advisory panels. Uh, Network Rail's uh, G Great British Railways Transition Scheme uh, has got a panel and it had its first meeting recently. And uh, I go through the list of the great and the good who are going to guide the transition to Great British Railways, uh, look at their backgrounds and uh, come to the conclusion that some of them probably uh, are not really relevant to the railways. And so I, I look at the, the gaps in their knowledge, for instance, uh, national railways, freight, uh, and so on, and make some suggestions of people who could probably be uh, more relevant. And then on a much smaller scale, we have East West Rail, uh, which is uh, covered in the latest issue of the magazine. Uh, they have their advisory panel and um, bearing in mind uh, that it's, we're just talking about a small, simple two track electric railway uh, between Oxford and Cambridge, um, possibly could be a bit over the top. Anyway, uh, I look at the panel and uh, two of the members are really heavy duty civil engineering people uh, who could provide a lot of useful information. But when you uh, go through the rest of the panel, well, my eyebrows started rising and they sort of nearly disappeared off the top of my forehead when I came to one member who is uh, an engineer uh, from the Dutch Hyperloop team. And you wonder what uh, he's going to make of class 196 diesels purring along what should be an electrified railway from the start. So a bit of fun to end the column. I hope you enjoy it and uh, I'll see you again next month. Thank you, Roger. A Hyperloop engineer on the panel. Well, I suppose he had to find something to do. My pan up column is a bit different this month, featuring David Bowie and a toilet seat. <laughs> I should leave it there really as a teaser, but I won't. I haven't forgotten this magazine is about railways. The David Bowie bit is about a trip to Tolworth to visit a car park which was once a pub. I'm not really selling it to you, am I? A group called the Community Brain realised it was 50 years since David Bowie first appeared as his alter ego Ziggy Stardust in that very pub. The nearest thing to the demolished pub is the station car park at Tolworth. And South Western Railway got involved with a silent disco at Waterloo and letting the group loose on a Class 455. That linked the concert at Tolworth to the disco at Waterloo. Now, I sense I'm losing some of you here, <laughs> but this isn't just about David Bowie. This is, just, uh, this is mainly about the Chessington branch, which it turns out is really interesting. It's a sort of reverse metro land built on the ruins of London. Now, the toilet seat. About as unfashionable an innovation as you could imagine. Nothing to do with climate change, hydrogen or traffic management. Yet it addresses a problem which is probably as old as train toilets. 
I take a look at how hard it is to introduce something new onto the railway, the years of effort, the number of people you have to convince, and the totally risk-averse nature of the business. There must be a better way, and as you would expect, I suggest one. So, that's it for this month. Loads of information, mixed in with a bit of entertainment. That'll do for me. Bye all. Visit www.modernrailways.com for more interesting and essential information about the British Railway Network. <laughs>